there's a lot of really interesting stuff in church history, and there's also a lot of things that need context to really make sense. Uh, and so it's important to me that you guys are tracking, that if you come across something you just think is bizarre, chances are it probably is, but uh, also there's, there's typically some things going on beneath the surface that might help at least explain why the crazy happened, all right? So uh, I'm going to give Floyd another minute or so, and, uh, and we'll get rolling. If you ordered a book, uh, they're not in yet, but they should be soon. So I'll get the, uh, they're not in yet, but they should be soon. So I'll get those two coming in. Fantastic. Welcome, welcome. Hey, you know what? You're, you're early in my book, so good stuff. All right, uh, let's go ahead and, and get started because uh, Ashley would shoot me if we don't get home in time to see the Braves tonight, all right? It's only the most important regular season game in our lifetimes, so, you know, it's just that. Uh, so we're going to do our best to get home in order to see it, and uh, so we'll get started and see where we go. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We're grateful for the privilege of so many blessings today already. Thank you for the joy of our small groups, for new members class, for uh, seeing folks baptized, for remembering you and the Lord's Supper, for singing praises to your name, for hearing your word read and preached faithfully, for a, a marvelous youth meeting this afternoon, and now uh, for a chance to recollect on uh, truly a hero in our faith by virtue of what you did in and through him. And so, God, I pray in all of those things to this point that you have been glorified and that tonight you would gain glory as well as we reflect upon the faith of a really, really important figure in church history. Help us, guard us, and guide us, we pray, as we seek to do your will and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. Uh, questions. Anything that you came across in, thank you, Erica, in the, uh, in the chapter that you'd like to kick around for a minute? Cheryl. With confidence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was about to say. All right, play that again, Chuck. Okay. Yeah. Just get the first part right. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to get into some of that with Luther, but uh, big picture, the, the Roman Catholic Church sought multiple revenue streams. I mean, that really sounds carnal. It is. That's what it was. Uh, an indulgence with your pardon or forgiveness from a specific sin. Uh, by the time that Luther comes on, so we're going to see tonight, uh, he's dealing not just with indulgences for you as an individual, but the Catholic Church had begun to sell indulgences even for people who were deceased. Uh, so they had created this doctrine of purgatory. Three copies. Floyd can airdrop notes to anybody who would like them. Who would like the, the copies? All right. Cheryl, your, your hand went up really quickly and forcefully. Presented as a means to essentially liberate loved ones who had been deceased from purgatory. Uh, and so it was a really heinous thing, frankly. And a person. Concern for deceased relatives that you loved has to be near the top of the list. So there's stories actually of... Uh, Roman Catholic priests, representatives, all, all different kinds, selling indulgences at children's funerals, for instance, to their parents, uh, to liberate them from purgatory. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a version of how one secures forgiveness of sins. Um, so that's it. Anybody else? Any other questions? Where's Leslie? All right, you tell her that I'm going to sell an indulgence for her forgiveness, all right? Yeah, that's right. Tell her a committed student would have gotten around those trees. That's right, absolutely. David, did I see your hand? Yeah, well, I don't know that we have a specific source as far as like when that was, that doctrine was created. It's. If you trace his history, by the time Luther comes on the scene, which is, uh, he was born in the late 15th century, but really for any meaningful ministry, it's the 16th century that he's on the, on the radar. Uh, the idea of an indulgence in purgatory, which go hand in hand in some respects, 
has been around that's pretty entrenched. Um, the doctrine, if you trace it all the way back, goes to a faulty understanding of the word sheol. Sheol is a, is a Hebrew word that you actually see, it's interesting, even in our English translations, uh, typically isn't translated into English. And the reason is because it's a, it's a very multifaceted term that there's really not an English equivalent to. Um, Sheol is understood based on its context as the realm of the dead sometimes. Uh, it can refer to torment predicated on somebody's spiritual existence. If somebody uh, obviously rejected Christ in the New Covenant or didn't believe in God, disbelieved in God in the Old Covenant, uh, they would go to Sheol. Uh, and so it essentially arose from some of those ambiguous texts in the Roman Catholic Church, took those texts, uh, and then translated it to everything. And so the idea there was even people who are believers um, may have some uh, residual sin that they need to atone for. They go to purgatory for a set amount of time, and it could be anything. Uh, and at the moment in which they've essentially paid their, uh, their due consequence for their sins and they're liberated to heaven, and the idea of the indulgence was you can facilitate or, you know, make that process go quicker uh, as, a, as a believer and as somebody on this side of, of things. Pretty, uh, just by their way. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what they would say. I mean, basically a, a believer in Roman Catholicism, I mean, they would say Christianity, but it's, it's as we're going to see tonight, it's, you don't even find Christ. But at this point in Roman Catholicism, it's it's horrific. <laughs> it's amazing how off course they were. Any other questions? And Sheila had to get some water. She's getting ready. Yeah, that's right. She actually, Sheila sells them outside tractor supply on Tuesdays. <laughs> They're non-refundable. That's right. I've told her she even puts them on pieces of cardboard at times. I'm like, you could at least print them up, you know. But, all right, guys, well, let's, uh, let's get to Martin Luther. All right, now, I, I've kind of uh, tipped my hand here, but just uh, maybe a couple introductory remarks, and we'll get into Luther's life. We're going to spend two weeks on Luther, all right? So what I want to do today is really trace his early life, because I think that's very important to understand where he was and how he arrived where he ultimately did as a reformer. And next week, what I want to do is really take the last portion of his life, which I would include his, his ministry phase, if you want to call it that, as he becomes a reformer in the church. And I also want to take maybe the second half of next week and just talk about some of his theology, what he believed. Uh, and the reason for that is become of orthodoxy through every generation. Uh, and so that's the reason why last week we, we focused on, uh, on John Wycliffe, right? Because there's somebody who was, uh, who was absolutely, because there's somebody who was, uh, who was absolutely going to be just kind of leading up to Luther as a public figure and really just the very beginnings of that with the 95 Theses. And then next week is going to be uh, the ramifications of his standing up to the Catholic Church and kind of the outworkings of that as he became one of the most prolific writers and speakers and theologians of church history. Uh, and so there's a lot to unpack there. Of course, I, I need to say this, we're just going to be able to hit the high points. Uh, and so there's so much more to learn. I would recommend a book to you. Uh, Eric Metaxas wrote a book on Martin Luther, a biography, which is excellent. Uh, he is, uh, Metaxas has some odd beliefs himself, so just, just hear me say that. But he's a very, very good, very gifted biographer. And so uh, the printing press kind of comes... Uh, to maturity, not, not when Luther was around, but close enough to where we have so much of his work preserved. And so we don't really have to wonder as much what Luther believed as we have to wonder what some hero of the faith, and like Augustine, for instance, we've just got a couple of his works that have been preserved. So anyways, point being, I hope that as we study Luther today that you'll get some idea as to why, why he was the way he was. What, what was it that drove him? I, mean, I think a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, and then next week, I'd love for us just to see how God could use a person in such a mighty way. In many ways, uh, Luther, from a horizontal perspective now, obviously God is sovereign over all things. God is using uh, this instrument. God is the one that gains the glory. But from a horizontal perspective, Luther is the tip of the spear, right? Uh, he, he, in many respects, is the first catalyst, 
and John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli and those that come after and very shortly after, by the way, uh, kind of pick up the uh, the onus as well and they move forward. And so that means because believe it or not, we really don't know a whole lot about Luther's childhood. I want to talk a lot about his academic experience. That's very important. And then we'll talk about his uh, conversion to the light to life as a monk. And then finally tonight, what I want to do is talk about his journey out of being a monk um, as he began to discover what the scripture teaches on some very important topics. All right, so Luther was born November the 10th, 1483. Uh, His parents, Hans and Margaret, or Marguerite, depending on which transliteration you prefer, uh, were both Orthodox, devout Roman Catholics. This means that Luther was raised in the church, Luther was uh, taught in many respects the doctrines that Roman Catholicism held to, and Luther also had plenty of advantages that were somewhat unique uh, for somebody that was born in his era. All right, the reason why Luther was so advantaged was because his family was fairly well off. In fact, his father owned as many as four separate copper mines that he used uh, to leverage income, so he would lease those. On occasion, he was a very well-known fixture in their community, sat on multiple town councils, and he was a man that valued education. That's very important. Hans Luther was was that Luther grew up in a time and in an environment in which education was a big, big deal. All right. Luther was sent to some of the finest Latin classic schools that existed in that day. And ultimately, as Luther became old enough, he was sent to a very prominent university the University of Erfurt, I believe is how you say it, to study law. The law was chosen for Luther by Hans. It's very important. Right? Hans saw the, the position of a lawyer as one of great esteem in the culture. It's probably changed <laughs> since then. But in that day, to be a lawyer, to be someone who represented the law and prosecuted or defended, predicated on the law, was something that was considered to be a worthy and an admirable achievement. And so Luther is steered towards uh, this commitment, and this is one of the reasons why Luther is such a, in many respects, is such a, uh, I guess, a divided man early in his life, right? He knows what his father wants. He recognizes that this is a big deal to uh, perpetuate the honor of his family. Uh, He desires to honor his dad, and he wants to be successful in what he does. And yet there's some evidence, and it's kind of secondary evidence, but there's some evidence that perhaps this isn't really what Luther wanted to do, right? And we all have frame of reference for that. Uh, It's probably a situation where Hans saw not just the the social acclaim that came with that, but also, remember what his dad did, it would behoove him to have a lawyer on staff. Uh, And so there's all kinds of tentacles to that. But the point is, is that Luther was well-educated. He was well-educated in secondary, primary school. And then he was well-educated for his years in university as well. What's interesting is that this preparation, this, this path towards law, intersects with Luther's later design by God in at least two very important ways. It is incredibly crucial, if you're going to understand the person of Martin Luther, that you get how this early university life influences the way he thinks and also influences the influences around him as it relates to people he would surround himself with later, all right? Two things that are incredibly important about his life as a student. The first is his training in law yielded a massively important, he counted guilty or innocent. And so Luther is brought up with this understanding of what constitutes justice. And when he translates justice from kind of secular lawyer arena into the religious arena, he begins to realize that mankind is facing a massive problem. The problem is that Luther realizes that the lawgiver is the omniscient God who's also the judge, and it absolutely terrorizes him when he begins to ask himself the question, how could a righteous judge look at me or any other person and deem me innocent? See the tension there? How is it That God could see me in all of my sin, in all of my transgression, and look upon me even if I attempt to do everything that the Roman Catholic Church says I should. If I confess my sin, if I attend Mass, right? If I purchase indulgences, whatever it might be. How in the world does, if you put all of that into a basket, does it add up to enough atonement for God to look upon me and see all of my filth and say, you're righteous anyway? 
Luther was alluded to, not quoted, but it was alluded to later in his life, that many people claimed that Luther would say, if God does indeed judge any of us as innocent, he's a corrupt judge, right? Now, we, we know that's not true. Later in life, Luther would discover why that's not true. But in this moment, you already have a young man that's really in torment because he's introspective. He's not the kind of person that's just going to accept somebody's answer without any reason whatsoever. And so he begins to wrestle with these questions. He begins to wrestle with melancholy, even seasons of depression and he begins to have this recurring dream vision nightmare whatever you want to call it where he's standing before the lord pleading his own case and god over and over again counts him guilty because he was right and so you can see how all of that comes together so that's kind of influence one of his early uh, academic years the second influence is incredibly important too and that's the influence of what we now know as humanism now, humanism in our society today means something very different than what I mean, <laughs> all right? Secular humanism today is this idea that essentially mankind is its own authority, that we dictate the rules, that there's nothing besides what you can see. Naturalism and humanism kind of go together in that respect. But historically, academically, the name humanism or the term humanism refers to a movement that's, uh, that slogan was ad fontes, which means back to the sources, and so humanists arise after an age of scholastics, and in scholasticism, essentially, any kind of fictitious, weird, strange interpretation would do. And so what happened was, over time, over seasons, you would have interpretations of interpretations of interpretations of interpretations of interpretations. This is actually what happens in Scripture, right? You begin with... The, the Bible, the Holy Word of God, and then you've got the church that interprets the Word, and then that interpretation is taken, and now another person interprets that interpretation, and before long, you're just miles away from the foundation of the Word. And so, the very beginning of Luther's university experience is kind of dovetails with the beginning of this movement, where people are saying, we don't want to deal with all of those things, we want to get back to the rock, back to the source. Now, to be fair, this was not a purely religious movement. I don't mean that it was just about the scripture. It was just an ideology, right? And so instead of listening to so-and-so's, you know, commentary on some sort of historic piece of literature, humanism would say, just let me read the book. And this influenced Luther deeply because it taught him to be suspicious of years and years and years and years and years of tradition. And so Luther had a proclivity as you study his lifetime and as you examine his methodology to go back to whatever he deemed to be the original source, which, in, which includes his passion for the word of God. He rightly understood that the church was predicated, founded upon God's word, and this meant that he always had a desire to consult it. And by the way, that was somewhat unique. See, in that day, you, you really wouldn't have encountered even multiple church leaders that had that desire. Most of them were content to just be told what it meant and just kind of carry on that interpretation or perhaps even come up with one even more fanciful than the last one. Luther was a different animal, and a lot of that has to do with his time at university. His time at university was cut, shut in, uh, cut short in a somewhat miraculous way. Uh, and it also marks one of the great turning points in Luther's life. And so he'd been at university for some time. He was traveling home or back to school. We're not sure which. Doesn't really matter for our purposes. And on that trip, he was actually caught in a life-threatening severe thunderstorm. Believe it or not, when Martin lived, there was no iPhone to give you a warning that storms were coming through. Uh, and so you just dealt with it, right? And so he gets caught up in this absolute severe downpour. And he describes this scene whereby he's traveling on a horse and lightning strikes very near to where he's walking, where the horse is walking. And so Luther, being the good Catholic he is, promises the saints above that if they would spare him his life, that he would become a monk. And lo and behold, he gets through the storm Lo and behold, he had made a deal. Lo and behold, he honored it. And so much to his father's chagrin, who really desired uh, for Luther to become a lawyer, he abdicates any sort of stock in university, and he enters himself into uh, a monastery where he became a monk, and a prolific one at that. All right, so to this point, 
We have a, a trained lawyer, at least partially trained, not fully trained lawyer, who is thinking in terms of law and justice, who now has some sort of debt to pay to the saints and to the God above the saints who has spared his life. And that leads to a very tormented soul. And so Luther enters into the monastery, and as he does, he is fixated on what he would later describe as the doctrine of justification. How in the world, remember we, we talked about this earlier, how in the world could God claim that I'm innocent? How am I going to stand before the Lord one day and be accepted based on my actions, my acts of faith, whatever it might be? What is it that God is looking for from me, and do I have it in order to be able to give? Luther is tormented by this. He's bothered by it. And his initial solution is the solution of all lost people. It was to throw himself into his religion and to throw himself specifically into his religious duty. Luther is described by himself and also by his peers as the most dedicated monk in the entire place, right? He was constantly beating himself, literally and figuratively. He was tormenting himself, denying himself, sleeping without a blanket because he thought that that was somehow more pious, soaking himself in water and walking around outside the monastery when it was cold, right? Denying himself meals, beating himself physically in order to somehow atone for his sins, praying at all times, dedicated to self-denial. In fact, he described himself later with this quote. He says, if anyone could have earned heaven by the life of a monk, it was I. <laughs> he tried it. He did all that he could to somehow earn his place, but every step along the way, he's still tormented by this question. He would describe it at times in his works, this this recognition that even when he was doing all of these things that the church said were pious that he had selfish motives and then he would realize well that's sin and so even when i'm doing this i'm not doing it with the right intent and so therefore i got to scrap all of that and start over and he began to realize that that there was just no there was no bottom to the pit of his soul everything that he attempted was stained by sin this threw luther into an absolute funk. He describes himself in this era of life as terrorized by the prospect of God's wrath. At one point in one of his journals, I believe, I'm saying this off memory, but I'm sure this is true, he describes himself as a sheep that's just awaiting slaughter. And whether slaughter is going to befall him in the next week, the next year, the next 10 years, the next 40 years, it didn't really matter because he knew that on the other side of death, he was going to face the judge and he realized the judge wasn't going to have nice things to say. This is a, a deep hole. Guys, I, I just need to, to pause here for a moment. This is the hole that all false religion inevitably leads to. This is, this is the reason why, the, the, the contrast between this and what we believe is the reason why we can look upon the gospel and say, it's such good news. Because the truth that Luther discovered is a truth that you and I should have come to the realization about as well. And that's this. If our salvation is left up to us, we're sunk. We're sunk. What are you going to do? We talked about this, I think, in this setting. I've taught several times this week. Maybe not. So I'll just say it. If you've heard it, just act like you haven't. Okay? Um, what is it that would motivate somebody to get into a plane and fly it into a building. The answer is their belief that that's the only sure way to get to paradise. That's it. Now, I know that's not true. I'm not defending the action. I'm just telling you that that's the kind of bondage that false religion leads to. Luther is a poster child of this. He's, he's absolutely just enslaved to this idea that he's not good enough. And he's trying, and he's, he's doing all that he can. He's, he's attempting to, to somehow rid himself of the sin that still stains him, but all along the way he realizes that every time he peels back a leg, he recognize until he began this journey into this desire or this goal of self-justification. And he sees no relief in Roman Catholicism because there is no relief in Roman Catholicism. One of the things, just stop here for a moment, one of the things that I hope that you've, you've seen in church history 
is that we and they are not the same. There's this kind of popular idea in our world today that, you know, we're really all, you know, we're basically, no, we're not. We preach a gospel of justification by faith alone. They preach a gospel of works. And those are diametrically opposed. They just are. Now, I realize there's a lot of the trouble for one of them just to get it. But I'm telling you that that would be an aberration. It would be like Bodie Balkum said, it'd be as likely as somebody getting saved in Joel Osteen's church. Right? Maybe it happens. But it's certainly not the norm. And Luther is really exhibit A of what happens when you honestly take that stuff seriously. Have you ever noticed most folks that you meet that are Roman Catholic are nominal? I've noticed that. Why? Well, the answer is because if you took it seriously, you'd go nuts. You'd go absolutely categorically nuts. Because it really doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it. And it demands so much of you. And there's never any assurance. I mean, you could live for 50 years in the way that they tell you to, and the last week you could blow it. And if you know anything about yourself, that's a real possibility. If, if my salvation was up to me, I don't know how I could sleep. I mean, somebody could cut me off on 288 tomorrow, and I could lose everything. Really. This is what Luther's dealing with as well. Right. So, he gets to the bottom of the pit, and then he describes his conversion. And his conversion is rooted in the understanding of the order of two words, and really the, the realization of the meaning of one word, in a famous text of Scripture now, Romans 1.17. The entire verse he quotes, but the, the last part of it is actually a quotation from a previous verse, and it says this, the righteous, which is what Luther was after, right? He wanted to be righteous. The righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Now, Luther says at first he couldn't get past the term righteous, right? He's reading it through the lens of self-achievement. And he knows that he can't be righteous if if the righteous are the ones that are going to live by faith, well, then there is no hope for him. In fact, he's quoted this way. He says, I hated that word, the righteous or the righteousness of God, by which I had been taught according to the custom and use of all teachers that God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. See that? And so he looks at it and he says, okay, Paul, I got it. The righteous shall live by faith. I'm trying to be righteous, but I can't. So what this means is if I'm not righteous, there's two options. I've got to go into the other category. And therefore, I hate even the standard because I can't reach it. It's impossible. There's no way that I could ascend to God's requirement for me. So knowing that he was an unrighteous man, he didn't find any consolation, right? And seeing the sheer vanity of thinking that the Catholic response to sin was sufficient, he was plunged even further into depression. What's the Roman Catholic answer? Go to Mass, go to confession, buy an indulgence from Johann Tetzel when he comes by, and that'll be enough. And Luther says, you're playing games with the God of the universe. He was right. Until an aha moment happened. I've quoted here in the notes that I'll send to your printout for next week, a pretty lengthy uh, section uh, from Eric Metaxas' book. It's important, by the way, uh, just, just so you know. We're indebted to a lot of folks around here, um, but when we use their stuff, we definitely want to quote them. So this, this next two paragraphs is theirs. All right, just so you know. Metaxas says this, The young Luther couldn't live by faith because he wasn't righteous, and he knew it. All right, so that's kind of the, the, the issue. If, if I'm supposed to be righteous in order to live by faith, well, I can't get to that standard. Meanwhile, he was ordered to take his doctorate in the Bible and become a professor at Wittenberg University. Well, oh, the irony. During the lectures on the Psalms in 1513 and 1514 and a study of the book of Romans, he began to see a way through his dilemma. At last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, this is Luther now speaking, 
I began to understand that we don't earn our righteous standing before God and then we live by faith. Faith is the means whereby God attributes Jesus' righteousness to us. It's the conduit through which the blood of Christ atones for our sins. It's the way that Jesus attributes his righteousness to our account, a doctrine that we call imputation. He says, I began to understand that the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. And here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. He realizes that what he couldn't do, Jesus did for him. And that the way to salvation is not achieving perfection as defined by the law. It's by embracing by faith the one who is righteous and who was perfect according to the law. And so the righteous live by faith. How? God deems us righteous by our association with Christ, the true righteous one. And this means that my responsibility and your responsibility is to believe on Christ and Christ alone. And therefore, we are justified by faith alone. It is the grace of God that sent Christ to atone for your sins and my sins. Jesus stood in your place. He stood in my place. He absorbed the wrath of God. The judge did deem us guilty, but he allowed somebody to take our penalty, our consequence. Jesus died on the cross. He absorbed every penalty that you and I deserve. He truly was buried, and three days later he rose again. And by virtue of his payment on your behalf and my behalf, now God can rightly condemn and punish your sin in Christ and offer you grace and mercy by virtue of Jesus' substitutionary work. That's the gospel. And that's really good news. Now think about this for a minute. This, this is exciting stuff. Think about a German monk seeing this. And nobody else has seen it yet, really. In this room in Denwood, Virginia, the product of some 500 years later. It's incredible. God was getting ready to use this man, this unassuming, really non-consequential monk from Wittenberg, Germany, to radically shape the planet. How? Because of this one little, seemingly, truth. It changes everything. Guys, if you think that you live before God accepted by virtue of your works then you have missed it. But if you know that you're a son or daughter of the king because of Jesus' work, then you've got everything. It's really that simple, and yet it's that profound. I wrote here, um, on the heels of this new understanding, actually, sorry, I'm still quoting Metaxas, on the heels of this new understanding came others. To Luther, the church was no longer the institution defined by apostolic succession. That's the Pope-ism, popery, papacy. Instead, it was the community of those who had been given faith. See that? That's a big difference. We won't get into that tonight. Salvation came not by the sacraments as such, but by faith. The idea that human beings had a spark of goodness enough to seek out God was not a foundation of theology, theology but was taught only by fools. By the way... The majority of people who call themselves Christians today would fall in the category of fool. Just for what it's worth. Humility was no longer a virtue that earned grace, but a necessary response to the gift of grace. Faith no longer consisted of assenting to the church's teachings, but of trusting the promises of God and the merits of Christ. See the difference? Salvation was not predicated upon how obedient you were to the Pope and to the councils and to whatever else. And that's it. Now, some people have misinterpreted, misunderstood Luther here. All right? there, there's a contingency out there that would say, see, Luther says there's no use for a church. Well, he had a funny way of showing it because he immediately started one. Right? Luther is not saying that there's no value in truth, that there's no reason to have pastoral leadership because that's exactly what Luther went into was a degree and, a, and ultimately, a, a, I guess, a vocation of leading people pastorally. What he's saying is, is that the measuring stick, the lens through which we view the world, the, the rubric by which we're graded, and the foundation is not what a preacher says, but what the Bible says. 
to the degree that the preacher tells you what the scripture says, they're worth their salt and they should be rewarded as such. To the degree that they deny it, then they need to be shunned. That's the idea. It's not that there's not a place for leadership because the very word of God that he returns to actually speaks to that subject. The issue is, is that the word of God is the foundation and that's it. So the question is, does every statement that we read, every statement that we affirm, all that we would say yes and amen to, does it square with the Bible? If so, then we should absolutely keep it. If not, we should throw it out. Ground upon which the church either rises or falls. That's it. If you begin to preach anything else, you've lost it. And if you affirm that, then you've got the very building blocks for a healthy, beautiful people as ruled and reigned over by Christ. In another place, Luther described this moment as a lightning bolt, which is interesting because it took me a while to realize that he was actually alluding to the second lightning bolt in his life, right? The first lightning bolt sent him to the monastery. The second proverbial lightning bolt got him out of the monastery. It was a lightning bolt in his life whereby God illuminated the truth of the glorious doctrine of justification by faith alone. And this led to Luther's conversion through faith in Christ. Immediately he was freed of all that entangled him as it relates to his desire to earn his salvation. And the biblical truth had been largely dormant for centuries. But in a young monk, it would make a comeback. One thought here, just as we pause for a minute. I, I know that... Um, you and I talk a lot, I think, and I, but I just kind of wanted to put this on your radar. When Martin Luther lived, um, it seems as if, it's probably fair to say, that he, he thought the world would end very soon, and he thought he had found the Antichrist, and the Antichrist was the Pope, and here we are 500 years later, and the world still exists, obviously, pre-Jesus' return, and the Antichrist, if you want to call it that, is uh, still yet to be identified, at least officially. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, one of the things that church history can teach us is that there's a propensity of people that believe the right things to react in the wrong way. Uh, there's a whole generation of Christians that have kind of accepted this idea that Christ is coming any minute, so they've just retreated. But what actually happened in Luther is the opposite of that. Luther was the instrument, along with others, that God used to bring great revival. In fact, the very tenor and the tone of the culture that Luther lived in changed radically in his lifetime and even after that. Because God was going to do something. And so my point is just simply this. Be open to the idea that perhaps God isn't finished and maybe his purposes exist long after we're gone. And maybe, just maybe, his desire is not to bring judgment and condemnation yet. It may be that his desire is to bring another revival in and through us. And you may say, well, who am I to be used in that way? Well, who was a weird German monk? All right? I'm not the only weirdo, even though I was called one this morning, right? There's other weirdos too. Yeah, in public. I mean, who cares that I watch wrestling every once and restored? And the truth of justification by faith alone would transform and really in many ways corrode everything. And that leads us to the beginning of the protest. I don't know if you've thought of this before. You might have, and this might be very elementary to you. But, you know, we, we fall underneath the umbrella, the auspice of what we call Protestants. Everybody heard that before? And the reason why that word is used is because our origins, the genesis of this movement, if you want to call it that, as splintered as it is in our day, is rooted in protest 500 plus years ago, which began with Martin Luther. What happens is Luther begins to apply this doctrine to everything. Justification by faith alone. And he, and he works out from that too, by the way. I had a discussion a few, few days ago with somebody from a Roman Catholic background that just reminded me of how entrenched those things can be. When they said, I'll pray for your forgiveness. Well, that, that ain't the way that works. All right? That's not the way that works. We have a great high priest. His name is Jesus. We don't need any of this other stuff. And this is what Luther begins to work through this. Well, if Christ is my means of righteousness, if Christ is now interceding on my behalf, why do I need to go to that building and talk to that guy? Well, I don't, right? And if Jesus is secured for me an eternal uh, redemption, if, if, if these momentary afflictions are preparing for me an eternal weight of glory, well, then what in the world does this indulgence thing have to do with any of it? Where do you find that anyway in the scripture? And they begin to point to it, and he says, well, that 
that doesn't really hold a lot of water. And then he begins to say, now, listen, if Christ is revealed chiefly in the scripture, then why in the world are we consulting the council of whatchamacallit before we consult the epistle that Paul wrote to the Romans? And so he begins to work through this. And in every step that he takes, it gets broader and broader and broader and broader until he begins to realize there is a divide between what the scripture teaches and what Roman Catholicism teaches teaches that's every bit as big as the Grand Canyon. It's massive. Of course, he didn't know the Grand Canyon existed, but you know what I mean, right? And so he begins to work through these things. He begins to reason with himself. And, and I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I had it when I was first converted, where I began to realize that a lot of what I had been taught actually really wasn't biblical. And it's kind of disconcerting at first, you know? And so, like, for instance, here's an example Uh, Matthew 18, this is kind of pithy, Matthew 18 used to be used all the time to justify really poorly attended Sunday night events, right? I mean, my entire childhood, it was, where two or more are gathered. Guys, that's not in the context of Sunday night worship. That's not what Jesus, Jesus did not mean that. Think about this for a second, all right, two things. One, does that mean that if only one of you shows up that Christ is not there? Is that what you're saying? I mean, that's a scary thought. You better travel with a partner at all times because if there's not two of you, Jesus is gone. Right? No. I mean, Christ said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Surely that applies to uh, when we're by ourselves, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like, think about John on the island of Patmos, right? He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. There's only one of him. Christ appears, right? And so I began to walk through that. Guys, that, the context of that is church discipline. What Jesus is saying is, if you go and confront a brother in, you know, in, in private and he doesn't, he refuses. And then you know, if, if you go with the couples, we'll, we'll just know this, assuming that you're on the right side here, that it really is sin, that I'm with you. I affirm your activity. He doesn't mean if the preacher's terrible and nobody understands that the word of God is interpreted through the lens of the context of scripture. And Luther begins to realize, man, there's all these things that are going on that I don't see any biblical justification for whatsoever. And so he's kind of smoldering and simmering. And there's this stage that young converts go through. We call it in, in seminary the cage stage. The cage stage of conversion is when you really need to put this person in the cage because they're dangerous to themselves and anybody they interact with, right? They've discovered some things, but they don't yet know really how to do it, and so they're just going to find somebody and unleash. That's disagreement with a guy named Johann Tetzel. Johann Tetzel was a traveling Catholic That's what he did. Uh, we defined indulgences earlier, just as succinctly as I could say it. An indulgence was uh, an agreement uh, entered into uh, by the church and by the person uh, who purchased it that for a certain sum of money that they could secure stuff. There's a funny story told about Tetzel. I think it's true. It's, it's repeated multiple times, but I guess there's really no way to know for sure. But uh, Tetzel was not beloved by a lot of people because he represented kind of this Roman tyranny, and he always wanted money. You guys have family members like that. Every time they come around, they want money. You don't like those people, you know? So Tetzel, if you buy this indulgence, you'll be forgiven of any one sin, any of them. It's a big deal because sometimes indulgence is only covered certain kinds of sins, right? And so this was like, this is one of those like, you know, massive shut QVC down offers, okay? Uh, and so this guy walks up to Tetzel, supposedly, I think it's a great story, so I'm going to tell it like it's true. I've seen it many places, but I wasn't there, obviously. Um, and he says, if I buy this indulgence, it will forgive any sin. Tetzel said, any sin. So the guy purchased the indulgence and then beat the mess out of Tetzel and said, that's my sin. <laughs> that's a great story. Um, whether it's true or not, I don't really know, but it's fantastic, right? Tetzel was known for many things, but he was known for this kind of cute little pithy line. He would walk into a, a locality and he would say, once the coin into the coffer clings, so coin hits the side, ding, a soul from purgatory heavenward springs. That was his shtick, right? 
I want to come up with a version of that for my house that's not heretical. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't figured it out yet to tell the girls. I'm not sure what it is yet. But anyways, um, this represents the exact antithesis of who Martin Luther was. And it really pushes him over the edge. He begins to realize that the Catholic Church as it was currently constructed. And it's very important to say Luther's desire at first was not to separate from the Catholic Church. It was to reform it from within. But he realizes this isn't going well. My, my, my ministry, my, my way of thinking is at war with the way that the Roman Catholic Church is teaching. And so he just decides enough is enough. He begins to, in one place he writes that he begins to see in himself or see himself in others. He realizes that what he's discovered by God's grace, which he always gave God the credit for, they needed to. And so... Uh, he's poked and prodded long enough that uh, he ends up posting his famous 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg. That took place in, on Halloween Day. Of course, it wasn't known as Halloween back then. October 31st, 1517, I believe it was. Those 95 theses were 95 critiques, if you call it that. Some people go so far as to say condemnations of Roman Catholic theology. And they were put on the door, and some people wonder why, why, why the door of the, of the church. And the answer is, is because the door actually functioned in that culture as kind of, in many respects, kind of a community board, right? So we look at it as this totally bizarre action, and in a sense it kind of is, but it was actually far more common to see somebody attach something to the door of the church because that was the, the gathering place of the town than we might think. Uh, and so Luther nails these theses to, to the door, and there's a couple things that are important, and then we'll will be done so I actually can get home and watch the first pitch. The first one is this. Luther's desire was for an in-house debate. His desire was really not what it became. You know, sometimes things start and they just, they, they get out of control. You can't stop it. And some people may say, well, well how do you know that? Well, the answer is, is that Luther actually constructed or composed these theses in Latin. And the reason why he did that is because that wasn't the common language of the people. And so he's literally attempting to get the attention of the religious leadership or the only other people, largely, who were instructed in Latin in that society, in that culture. And he's essentially trying to kind of usher them into an in-house academic, maybe even closed debate. He's trying to debate these issues with the proper folks. But the problem is, is that they didn't stay in Latin for long. <laughs> what happened was, and we don't know who, by the way, but somebody seized onto these things and began to reproduce them in the common language of the day. And when they got in the hands of the people, they resonated. Because so much of what he had pointed to, they thought, even if they didn't know that they had thought it until they read it. They begin to read these lists and think, well, that makes sense. And yeah, that's right. And yeah, you know, and, and on and on and on it goes. And so what erupts is really an absolute firestorm. These theses were a tour de force, honestly, on the topic specifically of the authority of the church versus the scripture. The, the question comes back to what ultimately speaks to these issues. Is it the papacy and the councils and the religious authority and tradition of the church? Or is it the Bible? This is where every discussion ultimately degenerates to. I had a, a dialogue years ago now with uh, a person who was, uh, had uh, entered into a homosexual lifestyle. And so these conversations are honestly very predictable. And so we, we begin our interaction. I say, can we just fast forward to the part where you and I talk about the Bible? She said, well, why are we going to do that? And I said, because you're going to ask me what I think. I'm going to tell you it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God thinks. You're going to ask, how, does, how do we know what God thinks? I'm going to tell you the Bible. And then you're going to say, well, how do you know the Bible is true? So let's just get there. Just, just be done with it and just talk about the issue, right? And that's really what Luther is driving back to as well. Here's the exegesis. I was reading the other day a debate between um, a philosopher and a theologian on the issue of uh, soteriology. I know you're just, just absolutely amazed and would love to hear that. But anyways, the point is, 
is that the philosopher says to the theologian, you've got exegesis on your side. All right, what he means is you've got the Bible. If you were to really, really study the Bible, dissect the Bible, then what you're saying is true. He said, but I've got philosophy. As if that was better. Right? But the wisdom of men is foolishness in the company of God. And so what Luther is driving at is the same thing. Listen, guys, the Bible says we're justified by faith alone, and the church says, well, that's not exactly right. Well, how do you know that's not right? Well, because we've had all these people that have come before you, Martin, that have said it's not right. And they represent the church. And, and Christ gave Peter and subsequent popes the, the kings of the kingdom. And so we're, we're built upon the foundation of the papacy. And the papacy has said, that ain't it anymore. And Martin says, I don't care what the papacy says. I'm telling you what the Bible says. There's, there's the tension. That's very simplistic, but, but it's true, right? The issue was the source of authority. Luther was quoted in one of the very first dialogues he had. In fact, I think this was in a debate, one of the first debates, maybe the first debate. He said that a layman equipped with the scriptures was superior to both popes and councils without them. Now, let's tie up the loose end and then we'll be done. Remember who we talked about last week? What was his goal? Absolutely. Remember? The goal was to take the scripture which was inaccessible to the masses and translate it and put it in the hands of the people. Why? Because the scripture is the authority. And the church is saying, they don't need it. They've got us. And Luther comes 100 plus years later and says, hey guys, you know, Old Jimmy down there that's a plumber, if he's got the Bible, he's got more authority than you've got if you're abdicating your responsibility to teach it. That's it. These theses struck a nerve with the common citizens of Germany. They resonated with them, but they also struck a nerve with the Pope and the religious authorities. Such that uh, the religious leaders of the day became enraged uh, because this man was creating such a stir and because he was, according to them, inventing doctrines that absolutely subverted what they had taught for decades. And so the stage is set for next week when Martin Luther waltzes into what we now know as the Diet of Worms or Verms, if you wanted to be Verms, if you wanted to be more exact. An amazing interaction uh, which illustrates for us Christian courage and what it looks like to really, truly believe in the God of the scripture. And so, uh, five minutes till we get out a little bit early tonight. I'm grateful for you guys. Any questions, anything to this point in Luther's life that, uh, that I could help with before we knock off? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it was actually in the it was in his, the context of his pursuit of uh, of the do, in fact Metaxas said it of a doctorate uh, during lectures on the Psalms and a study of the Book of Romans. So, um, so yeah, so ironically, <laughs> uh, the the religious authorities actually kind of pushed him to it, right? Uh, it, it's it's yeah, it's very interesting. So it was actually say the scripture, which is fascinating because. Uh, historically speaking, once Luther had received his doctorate, uh, in general, the Bible would then be removed from him. Uh, that's the way that that worked, because they saw the Bible as kind of elementary, and so then they would replace that with what other dogma it might be. Plenty of examples of that in their, in their history. Uh, and so he just never got past that, <laughs> which is great. It's a good thing. It's a good question. Any other questions? What, what we have today as far as exposition of the, of the scripture on a Sunday morning, there's very little of that in mass. Um, and so their job was to essentially tow the company line. And remember, the church was built at that point, the Roman Catholic Church, on tradition. And so it was far more important that, that they have a cursory understanding of the basics of the Bible and then know 
what the Council of Trent said, what the Council of Chalcedon said, what, and those were good ones, by the way. I mean, there's plenty that weren't, but that was, that was really the, uh, the tradition that was, that undergirded the church. And so they would essentially say, hey, listen, now let's move on from the elementary to the, to the meat. And that's grounded in the idea that the real authority of, of the church is not ultimately the scripture, even though they would say, no, it's there too. Really, it was the Pope and those underneath his leadership, right? Uh, which is a, a fascinating thing to think about, but it's the, it's the reason why the church got so far off course. Now, one thought here, Daniel, which is important, history repeats itself. You guys probably don't really run in these circles. I really hope you don't, but uh, there's a, a pretty large community um, and it's the Reformed community is what a lot of people will call it. That's probably a misnomer, but uh, a lot of kind of liturgical high church folks out there that have begun to push in seminaries this idea of the great tradition. And so it's something to, to listen for the next five to ten years. I believe you'll begin to see people quoting the great tradition as this kind of uh, conceptualized, summarized, generalized presentation of the scripture in a way that's maybe easier to uh, to understand. And so they'll cite confessions, some of them great, by the way, some of them not so great, as if they're the authority and there's very little scripture in their dialogue anymore. And you may say, well, that's never going to take over. Well, the answer is it very well could because history repeats itself, right? And so that's something you need to be aware of. That That's just man's propensity is to take what other men say and to elevate it. For one reason or the other, there's a lot of motivation behind it. Uh, and so that's that's actually happening right now in some of your denominations and, frankly, even in some Southern Baptist circles. Uh, so when you hear that, just connect the dots. That's exactly the same thing. Now, it's not to that degree. I'm not saying that we're anywhere near where, where he was because was, they were way out there. But it's how the train gets off track. <laughs> and if you let that go for a couple hundred years, you know, you take a step one degree off the direction you want to go, if you take enough steps, you're going to be a long way away. Isn't that right, math teacher? I see that. Fantastic. Yeah, good stuff. Any other questions? take a lot for granted don't we absolutely that's a fantastic observation true did y'all hear what sarah may said she said it really solidifies and i'm i'm going to generalize so um how blessed we are to be a christian today it's true who coined the phrase well it's a biblical idea um yeah and so i think just and the justifier that's in the two words are used in um i'm gonna cheat the google machine it's another reason why it's a blessing to live today um what's that i think it is you're talking about romans yeah so it, the esv says this for instance romans three twenty six. it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in jesus isn't that fantastic? So you see that Cheryl's pointing out a huge point here. Your sin has not gone unpunished. Your sin was punished in another. So that God can be just in punishing your sin and by his grace can justify you. Not because you've done it, but because somebody did it for you. Right? Very simplistic, but... Um, we talk with our girls a lot, just kind of in very small layman's terms. Consequences, you know. Um, it's and this is every every metaphor, every illustration breaks down at some point. Uh, there's some folks around here that have struggled with that historically, so please don't hear me say. I, I'm, but it's like Elizabeth or Anna Lee or Allison did something that requires a timeout, and I serve the timeout for them. Right? That's the idea. See, the timeout still needs to be there. Isn't that right, Mama? Got to have timeout. Um, but God in his mercy sent Christ 
to pay that penalty. And in that way, he's just. Sin is punished. It's just punished in Jesus. That's the, the servant songs, Isaiah 53 in particular, will be a place to see that. Guys, I hope this was helpful to you tonight. I'm so grateful for you and encouraged that you come out and, and hear this. Um, I love this stuff. And I think it's just so important. Uh, not because Martin Luther was perfect, but just because of the the example that he set and some of the things that we could take for granted otherwise. To Sarah May's point, I think it's, a, it's an absolutely astute observation. So next week we'll follow up with Luther, which means if you read this week, you don't have to read next week. All right. Um, uh, if you want to keep going, go ahead. Floyd, did you read this week? Oh, that doesn't count. Well, because you had to read it out loud to her. Yeah. Right. So, church tradition would say that you don't get credit for that. But wait, there's more. Um, so, that's right. I'll give you a second seal or whatever they call those things. What is that? Wow. Did you feel him in his grave rolling over or was that a... Okay. That's <laughs> All right, y'all. Let me... Uh, I, I, well, I didn't know at first where he was. It concerned me that he showed me that picture, but now I feel a little better. All right, we'll pray. Thank you guys for hanging out tonight, and um, I guess we'll see you at the next appointed time, Lord willing. Father, we thank you for this evening. I thank you for these good folks and just for the joy of being able to spend some time with them tonight to the degree that they illustrate and that they point us towards you, Christ. So we thank you for uh, your providence in establishing a revival, a reformation, as it were, through a German monk and others who would come immediately behind him. We're grateful that we now stand in that tradition, having known you, having heard the gospel preached rightly and accurately because your word has been rightly divided. And so, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't take that for granted, that we are humbled, that we're thankful to share the good news of who you are. Lord, I pray now as we go uh, that you would use us in any way you see fit to bring you glory, trusting that as we do so, that we will find great joy and peace and hope in knowing you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all.